Okay. Good afternoon to you, to all of you. Myself, Abhishek Chakraborty, Post Coordinator of English, Department of Humanities, Midnapur City College. I am cordially welcoming everybody to the national webinar on Nagic Space and Literature Theoretical Perspectives, organized by Department of Humanities, Midnapur City College. Today is Friday. In many cultures and religions, it represents the passion of the Divine Lord, or it is the day dedicated for the glory of Mother Goddess or it denotes a sacred day of worship. It's all about purity and hope. Now, we have to understand that the whole world is facing a global catastrophe because of COVID-19 pandemic. People are confused and conflicted about the validity of everything around them. To quote from Shakespeare's Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. Amidst this, we need hope and enlightenment. It will cast away the darkness, protecting the entire planet to go. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. In this regard, I am honored to welcome Dr. Sahil Muhammad Dalakul Hussain from Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology, Odisha, and Dr. Aninda Sundar Kole from Munger University, Bihar, as our torch bearers of enlightenment. I also wish that this webinar will serve its purpose fruitfully. Now, I would like to request Dr. Shudipta Chakraborty, Principal with the City College, to say something about our webinar and our college. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, I am glad to welcome all of you in this national webinar in the narrative space in literature, theoretical, theoretical perspectives, organized by the Department of Humanities, Midnapur City College. I am honored to state that Medinipur City College is growing very fast in the world of global academics because of our united front. Our college has earned some prestigious milestone within this very small time frame. Recently, we have achieved 7th rank in West Bengal and 41st rank in India in Education World Non-Autonomous College State in 2021. It is a result of our combined efforts and visions for a grand future. I am also certain that the webinar will also act as a leader, achieve that vision. In this regard, I would like to thank and welcome Dr. Sahil Hussain of Kalingo Institute of Industrial Technology, Bhubaneswar, Odisha, and Dr. Anindya Sundar Pole. Assistant Professor Department of English, Munger University, Bihar, for their presence with us. Finally, I am concluding my speech, listening and enriching. Thank you very much, sir. Now I am requesting Dr. Urbita Raj, Head of Department of Humanities, to welcome our honored guest. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Humanities, Midnapur City College, uh, a very hearty welcome who are on, on the other side of this virtual platform. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to extend my heartiest respect uh, to uh, Honorable Director Sir of Midnapur City College, Officer Pradeep Ghosh, and uh, our respected Principal Sir, Dr. Sudeep Chakraborty. Uh, today, we are extremely honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Sahil Mohammed Dilawal Hussain and Dr. Aninda Pole uh, to, in our national seminar webinar, uh, Narrative Space in Literature Theoretical Perspective. Uh, welcome, sir. Um, Dr. Sahil Mohammed Dilawal Hussain is presently working as an assistant professor in the School of Humanities, uh, it, uh, deemed to be University of uh, He is also working as the coordinator of School of Languages. It Bhuvaneswar. Um, uh, Dr. Anil is working as an assistant professor, Department of English, uh, Munger University, uh, serving in KKM College, a constituent unit of university. He has earlier worked at uh, Central University of Chhattisgarh, Bilaspur, and Ravinsa University, Kotok. Uh, welcome once again, Dr. Hussain, and uh, he will join later, obviously. And uh, no, thankful. We are very thankful to you for uh, taking our time and you are now with us. Uh, once again, thank you. Welcome to our national webinar. 
Uh, now I would like uh, you know to uh, I would like Obisek to carry forward this session. Uh, now Obisek, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam. Uh, now we are going to start our sessions. Okay. I would like to request Dr. Rajkumar Vera, Assistant Professor of English, Department of Humanities, to chair them. Rajkumar, sir, to you. Thank you, Obisek. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> as for the schedule, we have two consecutive sessions. Okay. So <clears throat> we are just going to start first session of today's webinar entitled uh, Narrative Space in Literature, Theoretical Perspective. On the behalf of the Department of English, Minnapur City College, we are very glad and fortunate enough to have with us Dr. Shahel Muhammad Dilabul Hoshan, eminent speaker and scholar. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Hoshan. Dr. Hoshan is working as an assistant professor in the School of Humanities, HIT, him to the University, Bhubaneswar, Odisha. He is also the course uh, co coordinator of School of Languages, HIT. His teaching domain includes professional communication, business communication for UG engineering course, English literature and language for UG and PG students of English in HIT, and KISH, Kalinga Institute of Social Science. He has taught a specialized course in Commonwealth literature to the UG students of Foreign Student Exchange Program in KIT. He is also guiding research scholars in the department for a doctoral degree. His research interest includes post-colonial literature, migration, race, relation, gender studies, ELT and ESP, educational technology and professional development. Dr. Hoshan has presented research papers in national and international conferences in India and abroad, and has published papers in indexed journals of repute. His uh, determination for knowledge has contributed to his success at winning the Inder Mohan Hopper Research Award 2017 IIT ISM Dhanbar for his publication. Dr. Hoshan believes in the philosophy that education brings positive change in human behavior and society. Now, uh, I would request Dr. Hoshan uh, to take over the session. Please, sir. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Raj Kumar Bera. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this, you know, introduction. Um, uh, and. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dr. Arpita Raj, HOD, Department of Humanities, Midnapur City College, and the convener of this program for inviting me to the national webinar on the United Space and Literature Theoretical Perspectives. I'd also like to thank Professor Rajkumar Bera and the joint convener and Professor Vishay Chakravarti, the organizing secretary for this occasion. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Pradeep Khosh, director of Midnapur City College, and Dr. Sudipta Chakravarti, Principal, Indnapur City College, for this event and the gracious invitation that he, they have extended me. Uh, I'm very much thankful to be a part of this uh, session. Uh, the, the, the title of this webinar uh, is Narrative Space in Literature and the Literature Theoretical Perspectives. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the literature is a fast span, I would say. And you know, touching upon all the elements in that term, quote unquote, literature would be very difficult for me as a person. So I'll be limiting myself to a narrative which we call as fiction. So my uh, discussion will be uh, lined with, uh, with, in particular, to the narrative space in fiction. So with your permission, may I see, share my screen? I'll have a bit of visual, and then I'll be discussing. Uh, Professor Abhishek, uh, can I share my screen? Yes, sir, you can, you can. Okay, okay, sir, thank you. Thank you. So, just tell me whether it is visible or not. Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, yes, sir, yes, it's visible. It's visible okay, now. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, so, I'll be limiting myself to the narrative space in fiction. Now, to start with this narrative space in fiction, uh, I took this as two entities, so narrative and space. We have to understand these two things 
you know, differently, which I believe. And as for the theoretical perspective, which is the title of the webinar, I don't believe that I will be delving much into the theoretical, you know, uh, theoretical part. I'll be keeping it very simple and I'll be trying to enumerate on the possibility of, you know, practical exploration, I can say. So the narrative space in fiction, as I said, that narrative and space are the two entities. Okay, it is at least for me, two entities. Narrative part is, uh, you know, my studies in, in, in post-colonial uh, fiction. I'd like to draw a bit of attention towards post-colonial narrative space and, and uh, some certain, you know, selection of the text that I have taken right now for this uh, talk. And then I'll be summing up. I'll be keeping it. I'll try to keep it very short and uh, uh, quite easy. Uh, so narrative, uh, as you can see that I have enlisted uh, 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 a famous thinker in this field of narrative and narratology, uh, Flodonik, Monica Flodonik, you, you might have known, known this, in this scholar. She is an Australian scholar uh, uh, and a professor, of course, and who, who, you know, narrate, who, who defined this you know, narrative in, in certain lines where she says, I quote, narrative is widely recognized as a discourse of human experience unquote so for flutonic what she tries to mean here is it is totally totally the human experience that somebody you know talks about shares uh, this particular you know uh, 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 this particular statement i like very much and i abide this while i do my studies as well. i have a slight you know difference in this, that whether if Ludenik would have mentioned the term human experience or, you know, recognized as discourse of human experience, which is shared with others, it would have been more suited to the term narrative, because narrative, if you talk about narrative, if you, if, if you say narrative, then it is always open. A narrative cannot be kept something within yourself as a narrator, as a writer, as a content creator. Okay, so the openness of narrative, when you, you deliver this narrative, you have to think on that. So the narrative is always, always a delivery to others, whatever experiences, whatever discourse you think of, you know, you know, whatever, whatever thought process are involved in your narrative that will be displayed. That is the part of the narrative that I believe. Okay. Now, when we talk about narrative, when we when we discuss narrative and when we try to know narrative in the sense we have to touch upon the following you know characteristics i must say uh, uh, to, to make it a narrative or to understand narrative first one is the rule space for description what is rule space any standard google search will lead you to the meaning which i have also mentioned in the bottom that you know it is a a, a role that a person takes is a role that a person takes and performs while he or she is doing this narrator's job. Okay, right now I can say that my role space in this webinar is as of a resource person, but I am narrating things, I am the content creator. But yet again, narrative is not only limited to the content creator, it is also with the content receiver who is receiving this narrative at the other end and creating meaning. Okay, so right now, whosoever is you know listening to this lecture, they have this role of you know the receptor. They have the role of the receptor of this narrative. Okay. So role space is an important. So when you talk about narrative or when you you know try to try to focus, try to create something which you can say as narrative, you have to define your role, whether your role space is that of a narrative or whether your role space is that of a receptor of the narrative. Because in both the cases, the basic task or the basic intention is to create meaning, create sense. So role space for narratives. Then the next one is capacity for living or imagination. This is very much, very much important. Again, from both the perspective, whether you are a, a, a content creator or you are a content receiver, you have this have you have to have this you know capacity for layering an imagination. Whether you are you are able to layer it, whether you are able to mold the object that you have in your mind on which you are narrating, or whether you can connect your imagination up, up with what the narrative is said and you try to create meaning. 
I'd like to give here a simple example, a very, very much simple and practical example. I'd like to describe a pen, a pen, a writing tool. Pen is basically a mechanical tool, a writing tool. We, and from, you know, from ages, we are, we are using this you know, tool to write, to, 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 to put, put our languages, put our feelings in written in documentation purpose. We are using this pen. So pen can be described, the layering of the pen at the first instance can be a you know, writing tool. But yet again, you have heard this, this proverb that you know, pen is mightier than sword. So here you connect imagination. Now sword and pen, these are two different entities altogether. Sword is one, uh, one uh, you know, uh, what we can say, part of ammunition or a particular type of ammunition, which, which, which is, extensively used in the medieval ages and which is uh, we, we can say that it holds the significance of power it, it symbolizes power but yet again your creative layering your capacity to imagine you know giving this particular stance and narrating the pen as a pen, mightier, mightier than sword pen is mightier than sword so the power location of pen becomes mightier than sword so this is your very capacity this is your imaginative capacity and as a narrative as a narrative you have to have that okay so this way basically you know whosoever is this content creator they layers things and they connect it to their imagination and then things are presented as narrative next one is capacity for textualization now what is textualization uh textualization simply could be understood as as what i can say is that you know a, a, a documentation thing as I, I i gave the reference to this particular pen uh, a pen thing uh, you know textualization is part of that and narrator as a, as a narrative you have to be very focused that whether you want to have your narrative a textualized purpose or whether you want to have a narrative as an oratory purpose because oratory narrative is totally different than a textualizing textualizing narrative or textualization textualized narrative okay so literature being being the core genre of you know studies and exploration you know when somebody is is, is uh, you know trying to narrate literature through his imagination through his or her imagination the textualizing narrative comes into the play so here people have a different focus and they try to mold their language of narration in 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 some different way there is no mix of protocolization of language no mix of you know what we can say common language but rather a proper language to enumerate on the narrative to create the narrative uh, next uh, i'd like to talk about the variables in scale of chronicles feature of the plot i have mentioned here in the uh, title uh, in the in the uh, brackets the feature of the plot variables in the scale of the plot now when a narrative starts when a narrative takes place okay the plot might be same but the scale of the chronicles might differ. The scale of the chronicle eh, can, can have a different layering, a different imagination. Uh, uh, here I'd like to uh, you know, give, uh, I'd like to draw two exa one example of uh, a historical narrative and a fictional narrative. One is historical narrative and one has a fictional narrative. Okay. Now, uh, to, 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 to discuss this, I would like to draw one example, uh, one reference from uh, rather uh, from, from the famous you know, web series, which all, many of us have watched is Game of Thrones, if you can see. So, so when uh, you, know, you see uh, this particular you know, narrative of Game of Thrones by George Trigger Martin, you will find that, you know, that there, is, there are seven kingdoms fighting for the seat of power, which is in King's Landing. Okay, and basically, if you look into the map of that uh, that particular uh, context, you know that, that that feature plot, you will find that the King's Landing is towards the southern side of the landmass that we are, you know, that, that has been discussed about. Okay, so this is a scale of chronicle. This is one scale of chronicle, I would say, but this is the fictional narrative. But when we talk about historical narrative here. Uh, uh, which, which is more of a, you know, a factual description, you will find 
that you know this particular you know landmass which we are seeing in this fictional world can be pulled into the context of the actual political you know history of england where there were seven prominent families royal families who were actually trying to you know capture the seat of power which is always always on the southern part of england so you know again the feature plot in which feature plot and and in what intent you are trying to create a narrative that is important whether it is a, a narrative with a focus of like historical things or maybe anything okay i i just draw the, uh, the reference of historical and the uh, fictional but but you know anything can be possible so variables in the scale of chronicle in narrative is again one thing we need to keep in mind next i would like to talk about a bit on the construction and reconstruction of 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 a narrative so construction basically whenever we try whenever we try and write our expression which is the experiences our 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 feelings which is very much very much innate to our 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 own mindset our understanding you know you know that is construction so narrative construction is is kind of a pure thing at the very first but then again when we are influenced with the ideas of people when we are we are taking inspiration from the writing of the other people right uh, you know we we try the construction so narrative in 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 that sense can be construction and reconstruction and most of the most of the narratives which we see is basically basically reconstruction anybody can you know differ on this point of construction and reconstruction with me but uh, 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 i'd like to refer to my 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 professor who taught me um, this uh, narratology in 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 my master's days who uh, you know fondly says that you know any narrative you know mostly mostly the or majorly the narratives are reconstruction because those are inspired by someone is those got a background to the origin of something and then reconstruction so again uh, for with reconstruction here i try to mean that you know the plot the actual plot of construction the actual thinking of 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 the construction and a narrator you know narrating that from his or her own perspective that is reconstruction and next uh, narrative where uh, we have room to interpret individual specific and now this one is 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 very much open to all of the narrators okay the room to interpret what you see what you perceive and then what you interpret and then write your narrative so this is this is very much very much you know individual specific okay and as i told at the very first you know first point of my my uh, you know talk that you know uh, a narrative is not only about uh, a creator uh, a content creation or a content creator it is very much very much involved with the other end who is the receiver so again room to interpret for both the possibilities for both the narrator and the receptor so 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 we have to understand narrative in that sense uh, next i i'd like to move on to the uh, next part of my uh, discussion which is space and uh, space can specifically mean the special aspect of the reconstructed world this special aspect uh, uh, can be understood as the you know locational locational possibilities locational possibilities excuse, excuse me sir yes sir uh, sorry to interrupt you sir sir if you kindly uh, change the slide actually uh actually i have changed um, sir but the change yeah yeah now, now yeah now now it's visible it's clear yeah. now okay sir okay okay sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, is it is it visible now yeah yeah it's visible it's visible okay okay, okay. So, so, so you know, we are. I was talking about the space, uh, you know, space, and I fondly can, I fondly say that, you know, space is a matter of politics, you know, uh, 
a, a, a space is something which we always long for in, in, in a man-woman fight, I jokingly say that, you know, we always aspire to have our own personal space, right? But here, the space which I am talking about is totally a literary space. This is, this is a play. This is a crown for, for, for where the narrator shows his or her creativity uh, uh, and, and that 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 you know that is the, uh, the uh, point between uh, two ends where the narrator shows the creativity to explain to narrate to present something. So you know uh, space uh, can be understood as you know points between two or more ends. This is a very physical description of space. You know uh, space can be understood as you know uh, emptiness or chasm. You know emptiness. The whole you know the, the the we can imagine the space between the earth and the sky that is totally empty. Okay, but 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 for narrator this is this place. This space is very much very much creative, very much very much practical, right? Uh, uh, you know this is this is the space. This is this is the uh, you know uh, what we can say. This is the dimension where 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 the narrator plays his or her part to bring out something which is which is more, more creative. Uh, now we can talk about the space in a different dimension where we can say that space is a difference of opinions. What you have opinion uh, on a particular area or a particular topic or a particular object and what I have as my opinion at, as it, at a, on, a, on that particular topic. So there is a difference of opinion and that can be termed as space. Uh, space is very much creative, space is, space is very much alive, and speech is very much dynamic. I understand that this space, the difference of opinion, it is, it, is, it is very much, very much dynamic. And as a narrator, when we are, we are, we are talking about this space, uh, we employ this to, to, to stand out with others, to stand out with the opinions of others to stand out with the description from others. Okay, so the difference of opinion, the space, the uh, dynamics, you know, this dimension is very much, very much like it, it is it is an independent and you know I can say it is a free space or it is it gives you the the the, the, the feel of freedom which is which is very much very much independent what you perceive what you see in this in that space, you are you are free to explore, you are free to narrate it as per your own understanding, as per your own philosophical inclination. Okay. But also you have to remember that when we talk about space, it is very much, very much interdependent. And interdependent, interdependency is a term which can be explained if in, in, in like you know you know, uh, you know one existence is not possible without the other existence okay and what is the play of interdependency in this particular space the interdependency plays in that sense that whenever you create a narrative in that space that you know that that you know dynamic that you know life field this interdependency makes helps you to create a logical narrative needs to help a humanistic narrative so interdependency the freedom you have you have freedom but then it again it is it is also very much very much interdependent in that sense because any narrative which which we create or are the content writers create the basic focus of this narrative is to grasp the imagination of the audience to make a maximum bridge to make the audience understand what do you believe, what is your point of view on this particular aspect. So, you know, space have this freedom, have this independence, but again, it is again an interdependent, you know, interdependent category as well. And as I say, again, in this part as well, that, you know, again, space. Uh, uh, if there is a room to interpret space in, 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 in a different way and any individual can interpret that in his or as per his or her own understanding. Uh, uh, if, if the uh, slide has changed, Professor Bera? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, okay. 
Yeah. So now uh, I'll talk about a bit on narrative space. As I told you that you know for me the, the 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 narrative space, the narrative and the space are different, and then the narrative space is totally uh, you know separate entity. So right now I'll talk about the narrative space, which is from the point of view of literature is the most important uh, you know term that we uh, we can say for today. Or, or, or it is always as of uh, as of the expanse of literature uh, that you know. And for this to explain this, I'd like to quote you know Ruth Ronan uh, twice uh, in in my in my you know in my short discussion. And Ruth Ronan uh, in his in his uh, in his in actually Ruth Ronan in her article you know narrative space or the space in fiction uh, talks about. Uh, this this uh, this as a domain of setting and surrounding of events, characters, and objects in literary narrative, along with other dominions, which constitutes a fictional universe. So what what she says, I'll repeat it once again. Uh, quote that narrative space is the dominion of uh, dominion of settings and the surroundings of events, characters, and objects in literary narrative along with other dominions, story, character, time, and ideology, which it constitutes a fictional universe. So in this particular you know, statement, what Ronin tries to you know, define is that you know, in, in narrative, whatever narrative you create, you have a fixed point of reference, fixed point of reference. And with that fixed point of reference, which you can, you know, terminate as, uh, in which you can, you know, term as space. Also, you know, whatever narrative you build, you build around that. You build around that, and you build it in terms of time and ideology, in terms of character, and if it is, you know, a story, if it is a journalistic writing, the nature, the type of writing is also again important there. And it is it is totally totally based on uh, on on the narrator's will and wish his 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 creative imagination in that you know dynamic space uh, to, to to constitute that fictional world or the fictional universe. Again, uh, in the later part of that same article, you know, uh, Ronan once again defines that you know narrative space is a semantic construct built with linguistic structures employed by the literary text. Now, semantic construct, uh, we all know what semantics is and, and, and what is linguistic structure is. So here, in you know, a narrative space, where a known and tries to define that whenever uh, a content creator, whenever a narrator tries to, you know, tries to, uh, you know, write his or her narrative, you know, they are, they should be, or they are very much, very much, uh, you know, uh, uh, concerned with the semantics and, and they, they built around the narrative in a particular linguistic structure, which which is focused basically on the on the on the level of the writers who will be further narrating it into his or her own views. Uh, narrative space. Uh, I'd like to you know put further for the light on this narrative space in terms of author's perspectives, in terms of you know. Uh, 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 what we can see, the imaginative perspective, uh, some philosophical perspective as well. So a narrative space uh, here, the, this is the author's space for narration. It is, it is totally free, free in, in terms of imagination, what the authors imagine. And it also is mixed and very much, very much, you know, uh, uh, what we can say, uh, uh, dependent on the philosophical inclination of, of, of the author or of the content creator, narrative depends on that. Uh, say, for example, I'd say that you know, uh, uh, in, 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 in the in the reign of uh, Hitler in in, in pre World War World War II situation and in with the World War II situation, many of the uh, you know supporters of Hitler wrote for uh, in support of Hitler wrote in support of him, Hitler, justifying the, those inhuman acts, justifying those, you know, massacre of people, massacre of common man without, uh, with, with a very much, very much ideology of, you know, pu you know a pu a purity, the idea of pure race. So philosophical inclination is also one 
one thing which 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 the uh, which the narrator's employs to narrate his or her speech so so philosophical inclination is also one uh, again one one important part of narrative speech uh, freedom of imagination as i have referred it earlier as well that you know uh, anybody anybody who is a writer who is a content creator they have their own freedom of imagination how they would like to imagine part or an object and they feed their imagination in terms in relation with the other you know sub tools of narration and present the narrative uh, next one i'd like to talk a bit about the freedom that the authors take in description and documentation uh, uh, this is one part where where, where the author you know describes if 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 this description is a, a, a written description i'd say it is a purpose is uh, you know a documentation then then the authors or the authors has 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 his own way of representing things right uh, next is uh, a narrative uh, can be explained in terms of literary factual or journalistic narratives you know uh, what is the purpose of uh, a narration that that is to be defined whether it is a literary narrative so it it, it will be considered as 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 uh, a fiction okay there will be you know some similarities of the uh, of the content with the actual scenario but yet again there will be a disclaimer for for that narrative that you know if it matches to some reality that is a coincidence okay so so literally so the focus whenever a, a content is created whenever a writer writes they have this very much particular focus in their narrative space that whether they are writing it as a literary narrative whether they are writing is as a factual narrative and factual narrative i like to uh, focus on this factual narrative is that uh, uh, it is basically a historical narrative when when you know, somebody writes from a point of documenting something to, towards history they have this factual narrative but yet again history is is a space again the narrative space of history is again you know a very much very much political space and you know uh, 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 the molding of history is 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 always been with us uh, we can say so yet again you know that you know factual narrative is also you know you know a very dynamic space if if again we talk at all about you know history being the factual representation of the data uh, the next one is journalistic narrative. Uh, journalistic narrative, as you say, that we what we watch in the in the larger media today. Uh, journalistic narrative, where you know facts, though it is not documented in that sense uh, as uh, the historical narratives are. You know, uh, journalistic narratives yet again, you know, is very much very much used to create uh, a conceptual truth. Very much very much used to create. Uh, a perception, you know, a, a philosophical, you know, molding of the person, and 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 journalistic narrative in uh, the narrative space of 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 uh, journalism is very much, very much, you know, these days it is very much, very much volatile. I would say, it's, it is very much, very much inclined towards uh, towards, you know, uh, you know, political prejudices. So yet again, that narrative space is also one. In, in 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 the main genre of 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 you know literary exploration journalistic narratives and then we have the freedom to interpret now this freedom to interpretation is as i always say that you know there are two points of narration one is the narrator and one is the receptor so whatever you receive whether it is a literary narrative whether it is a factual narrative whether it is a journalistic narrative you know how you you receive it, how to match it with the uh, factual data that you have at your end, and then how you get meaning from that narrative that becomes the narrative space for the receptors of those narrative. Right. So, so narrative space is 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 again, as I say, is very much, very much live, very much, very much political. You know. Uh, very much very much philosophy oriented very much you know uh, you know psychological i'd say it, it, it got you know very much very much psychological in inclination as well uh, 
So again, at the end, I always give this that you know, room to interpret whatever narrative space you understand it, whatever you perceive it, you can also have the space to narrate the narrative space to understand the narrative space. Uh, next, I'd like to you know touch upon a bit on the post-colonial narrative space. Uh, uh, now we are actually uh, you know trying to explain it into it in a from the point of view of literature. Uh, what is post-colonial narrative space? So, so see, uh, as I have, you know, written here that, you know, uh, there are two you know, uh, narrative space in post-colonial, uh, you know, post-colonial uh, studies. One is that, you know, center for power, whether the narrative you are having or whether someone is narrating from the center of power or whether it, you know, you know, you know, the uh, narrative is, is, is narrated from the, Colonies location. These are the two variables. These are the two different narratives on the same platform. It is just like you know comparing this, uh, like you know white man's burden can be won from the center of power, and brown man's burden can be won from the colonies location. Okay, so so you know it is very much very much political in that sense. You know space. So from which space, from which point of you know uh, uh, reference you are narrating. Whether it is a center from a center of power or whether it is the colonist location, you are narrating on the same thing, but the narrative space, the, the narration will differ, differ. The object will be the same, the settings will be the same, but the narrative space, the play in the narrative space, and the narrative will differ in post-colonial terms. Uh, uh, the special difference of this, you know, a narrative. Uh, in in post colonial studies helped us to 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 form and to form and to you know further uh, gives uh, give us space to 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 discuss on the following concepts of home and nativity uh, uh, from uh, we all know that colonization is uh, the mass colonization displaced people okay so when people are displaced you know and then only the concept of home and nativity, you know, location and dislocation came into play. So the narrative opened up uh, from that point of view when when people are displaced. So again, you know, colonialism helped to create this, you know, this particular narrative of home and nativity. It also helped to create the net, you know, uh, 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 the narrative of displacement and exile. It 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 help the create uh, the narrative of migration and relocation you know crossing the borders everything you know loss nostalgia cultural differences global economics global politics and whatnot you know post-colonial studies you know post-colonial narrative space open up all this majority majority terms to discuss and read on the innate happenings in these lines uh, uh, if you start, uh, you know, in a, enumerating on these, you know, very, these very much, you know, terminologies, it will, it will take uh, a, a, a longer discussion to actually complete. Uh, so just to just to touch upon, just I have mentioned these terms, and at the outset, I have just tried to, you know, brush up things how these terms are very much related to the post-colonial expressions and how the narrative space uh, in these lines can open up different narratives, different concepts, different realities to the receptors. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to draw just, you know, uh, you know a reference to two texts, uh, uh, which is one is both, are, both of them are the post-colonial texts where, as I said, that one is written from the uh, colonized, uh, colonized location and one is written from the, you know, colonial, you know, setup. Yet again, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they explains uh, the, the the stances of you know uh, colonialism and and the stances of you know colonized people. Uh, so uh, I, I have taken you know uh, Midnight Children as one by Salman Rushdie, and uh, this this text is very much very much you know known to all of us. Uh, and and this this text you know talks about the narrative of a colonized priest. It traces the history of India from the you know colonial days. To the post-colonial days till the end of the emergency. So it is a historical narrative, and as I said, you know, you know, historical narrative 
again but it is it is a literally historical narrative you can say okay it is not that you know too much of exactly documenting history but it is very much very much influenced by the history and how colonialism uh, you know shaped uh, uh, the future course of uh, of a particular land that narrative is 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 documented in this literary piece of writing which is midnight children it is a masterpiece and i like this novel very much that's why i have taken and the main protagonist of this you know uh, this novel is salim senai who who who, who sees this you know who, who observes this uh, uh, this you know narrative piece of history of indian history you know colonial and post colonial from a point of you know hybridity a point of a third eye he, salim sinai if you have read this novel you will you will find that salim sinai is a changeling changeling in the sense that he got a biological mix he is biologically a son of of a departing colonialist and a very simple indian woman but yet again he was you know born you know brought up by a different different family so 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 the the, the position of 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 salim sinai uh, you know that the narrative space for salim sinai here becomes you know you know a hybrid one and he he explains this you know this particular stances that the the plot we can say or or the or the role space or the role space from the point of hybridity from the point of neutrality and then we have the black album by hanif qureshi uh, this is another text uh, uh, written in 1991 but yet again it, it it talks about the colonial colonial stances on the post colonial world of of the colonized people in the seat of power that is england and how you know uh, the dream the 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 the, uh, the american dream as we say the england dream uh, the dream of england was very much very much real in the post colonial uh, you know days of india and people you know had migrated in those places so so the black album you know though it is not you know uh, written from the indian context i would say but it got some indian answers free yet again you know it talks about the people from from the commonwealth countries who who migrated with their dream of england and you know settled there and what all happened with them in that space that in you know, a seat of power the colonial space okay the narrative of that so yet again you know the narrative you know as i said is very much very much dynamic you know it it it, it can be it can be from from it, it is basically basically the from the point and the perspective of what the the writer intends what the writer or the content creator perceives that is is actually reflected in 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 this narrative space and what comes out as a as a narrative whether it is a literary narrative whether it is a historical factual narrative which is history or whether it is a journalistic narrative so so with this uh, i i say that i will stop and uh, I'll, I'll i'll have some discussion i'd like to have some discussion with uh, with uh, the audience uh, if if I am allowed to in this in a narrative space. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for your valuable presentation. I think uh, participants get uh, enraged with your uh, informative and insightful uh, presentation. And sir, uh, there are some queries from the side of the participants regarding this uh, lecture. So I'm just presenting before you the queries. First one is, uh, how can we differentiate narrative space from narrative discourse? Okay, and, okay. I think space and narrative discourse, yes. So okay. uh, may, may I present all the queries to three or uh, two or three? Yes, sir, yes, sir. yes, sure. This is the first one. Second one is, uh, is there any concept of non-narrative fiction? non-narrative fiction okay and uh, 
third one is during the time of interpreting the text how the readers will handle the narrative space how can you just uh, the last one is very much very much interesting i'd say the first one is what is the difference between narrative uh, discourse and narrative space so so discourse i'd say that you know discourse is not a free space narrative space as i talked about is very much very much free it always you know it as i said that it is interdependent when you create a narrative but you know discourse is a set is a set course of line through which you see right so is a post colonial discourse okay but also narrative space when i talked about you have to be very clear that you know narrative space is the space of freedom it is it is a, a free space where you play the role you are the you are the ringmaster of that you know free space what you want to create so discourse is a set genre narrative space is a free entity i would say this is the first question if i have uh, satisfied that answer uh the second one uh is uh, uh professor bera if you can just you know uh, say once more the second yes, yes, yes. second one is is there any concept of non narrative fiction uh non narrative fiction uh i don't know in that sense i cannot uh, you know specify on that or give you a particular name but in a non narrative fiction uh and like you know any imagination is uh, no, I, I don't believe so that you know if you if we're talking about something else like you know factual documentation a non-narrative fiction fiction in the sense if you want to mean it uh, uh, as, a, as a storyline uh, uh, I don't think so I don't think so that that is you know a non-narrative fiction in that sense but if you talk about you know non uh, you know uh, you know uh, non-fictional narratives that is different non fictional narrative is very much very much prominent but you know uh, like uh, uh, you can say if i give you the example of east and west uh, salman rush is one of the masterpieces uh, and one of the you know very much very much post colonial you know very much very much post colonial explanation you know east and west that is a very much very much you know, non fictional narrative but you know uh, the other part i i i don't think so i don't think so that that is uh, a case uh, but but again yes, you know that is a possibility to explore we can see uh, uh, the last question was uh, yes on the last question was uh, during the time of interpreting the text how the readers will handle the narrative space oh how the readers will handle the narrative space during the time of uh, you know reading so so again uh, you know when i believe you have you have heard uh, one theory which is you know says that you know the author is dead the author is dead and if you remember you can refer to this theory as read and response okay so when you were you were here the narrative space will be handled as per your own convenience what you what you see what you, what you perceive you, you are the soul now you are the creator when you got a text okay you have the, the scriptures in your hand now you are reading through it you connect your dots and you create meaning so you are you are the player in that narrative space you have to handle it and you don't get influenced by what the author is saying okay so as i said that interdependent the narrative space is interdependent so try to employ the interdependent points that you have and then explain or then get into the narrative and try to emulate the meaning that would be my suggestion for this i have okay. answered that very okay sir uh, another query is last uh, yes yes uh, in some cases or some literary works, we can see that the narrator is actually confused and questions us. Is there the concept of narrative space valid as the narrator isn't sure about the message he wants to give? Okay. So yet again, see, confusion is, is one, again, a perception, I would say. Uh, uh, because in the narrative space is very much, very much vast. Uh, we don't have uh, fixities in, in the narrative space. Fixities in the sense, you know, 
what we are trying to understand and what what the person is trying to see okay so the confusion can be from both of the part and i do not denote it only to the writer but it can be on the part of the receptor as well right uh, 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 you know factually you know the receptor and the narrator both can have a misjudged apprehension of the narration when he is creating and one is receiving right so i don't say that you know uh, that that we should conform to this fixity of it every as as you know postmodernist approach it says that you know you know anything you know any possibility is is not of you know not of no value anything any creation is of no value this is totally a uh, totally not a concept you know totally uh, you know it is it is not you know, of no value concept is not non existent in the post 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 modernist you know approach so we as 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 uh, you know, narrators we as receptors we have to uh, be in that you know that space where we have to try and emulate the meaning but not uh, you know uh, try to judge uh, both in the, uh, the both the points you know both the poles in that sense uh, if if that you know clears the confusion okay sir okay thank you for your again explanation proper explanation of the queries thank you sir thank you again sir for your presence and valuable presentation and uh, now uh, actually uh, i'm going to uh, start the session second second session uh, again we are very glad and we are very fortunate enough to to have with us uh, our uh, great speaker an eminent speaker you know uh, dr roninder sundar pole assistant professor of munger university bihar uh, let me introduce uh, dr pole uh, Dr. Aninda Sundar Pole is currently working as an assistant professor at Department of English, uh, Munger University. Uh, particularly, he is serving in KKM College, a constituent unit of the university. He has earlier worked at Central University of Chhattisgarh, Bilaspur, and Ravens University, Kotak. His doctoral research area is American homicide and crime literature. His areas of interest include popular fiction, modern theater studies, performing arts, and aesthetics. Dr. Foley has some scholarly publications in some reputed national and international journals, and he has presented many research papers in various prestigious nation and international conferences. So I would request uh, Dr. Foley uh, to take over the session, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ajkumar. Uh, for the warm introduction. At the outset, I would like to offer my sincere gratitude to Midnapur City College for uh, providing me this space. Uh, I would uh, like to, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Ghosh, the director of Midnapur College, and Dr. Chakraborty, the principal of the college, and of course to Dr. Raj, the head of the department, Department of English. In Napu City College, and I thank them for kindly inviting me to deliver a talk. I also appreciate the efforts of all the other faculty members uh, from the department, especially my old colleague and friend Rajkumar, uh, for organizing such an interesting online academic venture for the students in this difficult time. Uh, Appreciation is also due to the organizing secretary of the webinar, Mr. Chakraborty, who had done a, a tremendous job in putting the sessions together. And in my talk, I also welcome all the other attendees, especially the stu students. And I am told by Rajkumar that the target audience of my talk would be the UG and PG students. So I have framed my uh, talk accordingly. Okay. So, in my talk, uh, what I'll do, I will be dealing with the basic concepts of post-colonialism because I was asked by uh, Mr. Rajkumar that uh, I need to talk on post-colonialism. So I'll be talking about the basic concept of post-colonialism 
and I will try to illustrate it with several important examples from on and off grid. Okay, so let us begin. Uh, let me share my PPT first. Is it visible, Rajkumar? Uh, no, it's not visible. It's still... Is it visible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's visible. Okay. Is it visible now? I guess it's visible. Yeah, and still it is not visible, but I think it will come. Okay. But it's still uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now it's getting okay. clear. Yeah, yeah. It's clear now. It's clear. Okay. So I have titled my talk as postcolonial theory and practice and introduction. So before I begin my talk, uh, let us see the outline of the talk. In this talk, I'll be talking about a uh, very brief history of colonialism. In this particular part, I'll be talking about how colonialism came into effect in, uh, in our history, our world history. And in the next part of my talk, I'll be devoting the next part by, uh, by talking about the important concepts related to post-colonialism all the basic concepts rather and from that cue i will be taking about i will be talking about a very brief introduction to the post colonial literature and last but not the least in the last part of my lecture i will be talking about how post colonial criticism are actually practiced in literature so in this part i will be talking about several important uh, literary and non-literary works and how they are actually act they actually act as a criticism of the postcolonial discourse okay so let us begin so yes so the moment we talk about postcolonialism the term which comes to our mind is colony so what was the colony what is the colony colony in if we study history we can see i have presented one world map here where uh, i have given uh, several uh, places uh, with several colors which are the places been captured by by which of the uh, institutions or which of the countries so mostly if we study colony formation you can see that it is the european domination and which started in the 15th century mostly because 15th century was also the time of uh, discovering new paths, uh, new passageways. So that was the time of colony formation. Uh, from the, this map we can see that um, all the pink ones are British colonies and there are other colonies governed by the other countries like Spain, France, England, Portugal. If you see the map of the uh, Africa, you can see uh, most of the part is being governed by French and some part of the America as well. And South America was predominantly uh, colonized by uh, Spanish and Portuguese invaders. So it was a map where it talks about all the European colonies. And if we see to uh, see how the colonies actually developed uh, till world war ii till the independence of india uh, most of the colonies were there actually and gradually all the countries which were colonized uh, gradually got their independence so this is the colony now the two important terms colonizer and colonized okay so the main objective of postcolonial criticism is to define how all the formerly colonized people uh, or any other population 
has been subjected to the political domination of another population. So that is what we are studying here. So these include not only post-colonial literature is not only uh, fixed only to the uh, British colonies. It had several threads. I mean, uh, if you study African colonies, or uh, if you uh, study about the Aboriginal Australian uh, people whom were being colonized by several other foreign uh, countries. So we can see that the dichotomy between colonizer and colonized is always there. And post-colonial criticism and post-colonial critics, they actually talk about this dichotomy. And they also talk about several global issues. They compare, they contrast. Like one post-colonial critic may compare the colonies in India, the British colony in India, and the Caribbean colonies by the British people. So, here comes the type of comparison, okay, and these kinds of aspects can be studied in post-colonial history and in the understanding of post-colonial literature. Then uh, let us know something about post-colonial criticism. Post-colonial criticism is something which analyzes literature uh, by uh, cultures that developed in response to the colonial domination writer by colonized and also the formerly colonized people. So it talks about the struggles, it talks about the trauma, it talks about all the difficult things which the colonized had to suffer uh, from the yes, the colonized had to suffer and it also seeks to understand the operations. There are several kinds of operations which come into existence through post-colonial criticism. The political operations, the social operations, the cultural or the psychological operations of both colonialist and anti-colonialist ideologies. And it also analyzes the, all the important ideological forces which praise the colonized to internalize the colonizer's values, regarding which I will come back the next part of my lecture. Now, one very important uh, side effect or the byproduct of colonization is cultural colonization. Here we can also come across another term, decolonization. Decolonization is the process where the colonizer actually gives away the land to the colonized, to the formerly colonized, and slowly they decolonize them. Too. Okay. But despite this kind of decolonization, there are certain ways which we need to keep in mind is that the cultural colonization, that is one of the byproducts of colony formation. What is that? Exactly what we are doing here. We are studying English literature. We are uh, studying in, uh, we are pursuing our higher studies. We are doing our masters in English literature. So the government in India is actually been run by uh, the principal language in India. That kind of governance is the British language system, the English, literature, English language. So Despite of our independence from the British, almost so many years has passed, but still that kind of cultural colonization is evident in our lifestyle, in our education, in our governance. And it is the British value that actually degenerate our, or rather say, all the formerly subjugated peoples, their culture, their morals, Okay, so that's an effect, direct effect of cultural colonization. And as a result of the cultural colonization, all the psychological inheritance of the negative self-image. So 
the colonized people, the formerly colonized people, after their independence, keep on carrying their negative self-image. And they get alienated from their own culture. So on one hand, we have the colonizer's culture, which actually dominate, dominates the colonized culture. And because of that kind of domination, there is certain negative self-image, which takes a very important role in the cultural colonization. And this leads us to the belief system, which is also known as Eurocentricism, is that all the Anglo-European cultures, all the European cultures, uh, their styles, their uh, all the important things like morals or uh, physical appearance, everything, all these things are sophisticated, sophisticated. So this create one binary. The other people, all the other native people, all the other colonized people, they are defined as savage. Since when someone is putting one race at the top, it evidently means it automatically putting the other one much, much below. And because of this kind of Eurocentricism, colonizer actually considered colonized as savage, backward, and of course underdeveloped. So here is a uh, here is a cartoon which I have found from internet where they are actually uh, here it's written that we would like to em embrace the concept of cultural diversity, but through the form of diversity, what they are actually trying to say the foreigner who has actually visiting this land of the natives, he is actually trying to destroy their own culture, their own native culture, and they are forcing them to embrace their cultural uh, presentations. Okay. So, as I was talking about Eurocentricism, so it gives rise to two things. One is the European race, they are very civilized, they are, uh, they can rule the world. And on the other hand, we have all the negative kind of people, the other people who are uh, very much inferior, they are less than fully human. And this seeing others inferior is also known as othering. Okay. So, Eurocentricism actually gives rise to the concept of othering, where always we have these two words, which is very popular, us and them. Us, if us denotes the civilized, the Eurocentricism, the European people, it easily is equally considered the others, the them as others of savage. Now, the term savage is very important. It for one one it talks about the demonic other people, the inferior people, and they also had a kind of primitive beauty. They are very much close to nature and they are called exotic other, about which we have several important books written. Okay, I will come back to that point later on. So European culture is considered as the standard to all the culture. We have read out touchstone method, right? So in touchstone method, what we have understood, it is that you have to judge certain books through running it, com comparing it with classical writings. So it is something like that. European considered their culture superior. So if you have to judge other culture, you have to compare it with the European cultures. So this is, is the effect on Eurocentrism. Now, Eurocentrism had some other effects uh, like creation of world. We call first world, second world, third world. So first world is all the European forces, the Eurocentric forces like British and of course we have United States. Second, second, uh, second world countries are also there like the Caribbean populations, Australians, New Zealand, and South Africa, Soviet bloc, China, and all the developing countries, 
all the colonized countries, formerly colonized countries, are considered as the third world nation. Our country, India, is considered by the Europeans as the third world. So it is also a kind of form of Eurocentrism. Okay. And of course, there is four fourth world countries like uh, the Native, Native Americans, uh, Red Indians, the, or the Aboriginal Australians. Those people are uh, side pushed and those are considered as the fourth world, a uh, fourth world cases. Okay. So now let us move to another important concept which is very much similar to the Eurocentricism. It's a very specific form of othering actually, which is called as the Orientalism and which is first pointed out by famous post-colonial critic Edward Said, who said that because of that Eurocentricism, Europeans produce a positive national self-image and with that kind of self-image, they actually judge other cultures. For example, uh, they consider the Chinese or the Arabs or the other Asian countries, especially the Middle East. And those are defined as cruel. They are actually snake chairman. Uh, kindly follow the uh, cover picture of this particular group, Orientalism. One lady is actually holding a snake. So, snake charmer is a word, is a, is a phrase which has been often used in connection with Orient. And all the Orient people, they are considered as sneaky, evil, cunning, they are very much dishonest, and they are given to sexual promiscuity, they are pervert. And compared to Orient, we have that Eurocentric view is that Occident. Occident is the citizens of the West which who actually define themselves in the imaginary oriental of course it is imaginary it is uh, it is very wrong on part of the europeans to define one culture as to generalize one culture as like snake charmers and evil and sneaky something like that so occidents that means the european countries by denoting Orients as evil, they use this form to justify their act of aggression, be it military aggression, be it economic aggression, and whatever things which becomes become suitable for us that have been accepted with both hands. So that is the main objective of Orientalism and Occident and Orient. Now let us uh, let me give one example. Uh, I have mentioned one famous novel here, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the Promon Modern Prometheus. Those who have read the novel, you will see so, uh, this novel, which was published in the year 1818, it has a very uh, small incident uh, where there is one Arab merchant. I am not going to study the entire novel. A small part of the novel which is very interesting in this context that particular Arab man, merchant was been saved from prison by one European and in the context of the novel it was shown later on that he was very much deceitful he actually betrays the European the person whom actually whom he was saved so this is the negative representation of the Orient, which has been unconsciously put into their works by all the all the Occident writers, all the Eurocentric writers like Mary said. Okay. And in this context, one important term comes to our mind, which is white man's burden. So it is the white man's responsibility because the other is the other the savage, others are savage others are illiterate others don't know anything so it is the white man's responsibility to save the colonized to educate them just like in this particular novel that young uh, d lessey the young european who was actually who had to save 
the arab merchant okay so that is anton's representation of the orient by mediselli in this particular novel now one important term which is again a card a part of the white man's burden is that because of this white man's burden uh, because of this kind of colonial discourse british had actually established so many schools to uh, inculcate british culture and values to the indianese people and they they uh, while doing so they actually talk about that they are actually supporting the others okay so but as a result of this kind of so called uh, support the cultural domination they gives rise to a separate class some kind of very important colonial subjects who do not resist colonial subjugation because of their british newly learned british culture i have to, uh, given the example of babu culture in kolkata where all the people who are western educated who have studied in uh, british established schools they used to imitate their colonizers in dress in speech in their behavior in their lifestyle and we can see there is a very good presentation of mimicry they actually mimic their colonizer so when colonizer colonized person or the subjugated persons does not resist colonial subjugation and they follow their colonizers in several aspects like in dress or speech or behavior we call it mimicry so this mimicry reflects the desire of the colonized individual to be accepted by the colonizing culture so they want themselves to be uh, known as so called pseudo europeans and they actually experience certain shame to accept their own culture so mimicry gives rise to this kind of double consciousness where there are the coexistence of two antagonistic culture the european culture which they have actually learned in european schools and their own culture which is the indigenous culture and in the mind of the colonial subjects who are uh, who have actually done the mimicry who have uh, followed all the european traditions we bear this concept of double consciousness and this double consciousness this by product of mimicry leads us to the next part that is the unhomeliness now all of us know about that uh, table of crow with a peacock feather right so all of us have uh, learned about this table in our childhood days that crow there was one black crow who has found one peacock feather so that crow tuck that feather inside uh, his uh, feathers and he was very much uh, he was a fan of peacocks so as a result at the end of the feather we could find that he was uh, he was neither in the side of the peacocks nor in the side of the crows so this kind of double consciousness actually leaves this particular class who actually mimics the colonizers they despite having their home they are not in their home so it is been it's a kind of psychological limbo and it's a it's an effect of the trauma of the cultural displacement with which with in which they used to live and humi kebaba in his concept of unhomely unhomeliness talks about the concept in a very simplified manner unhomeliness is not unhome or not homelessness people who don't have a home 
we can call them homeless but if you have a home and despite staying inside your home you cannot feel at home that condition is known as unhomeliness which is an essential byproduct of mimic now let us see what are the problems of rejecting the colonialist ideologies so colon uh, we will totally agree that uh, the aboriginal or the native languages native cultures had to be adopted by the formerly colonized people okay in order to reclaim their pre colonial past for example in case of india uh, the past before the british people so there are certain writers like nubi kenyan writer nubi othongo so he started writing in his own languages own local languages local dialects but while writing in his local languages he found what very uh, severe problem what was that he was finding difficulties in the publication industry because uh, unlike english language which has been spoken all over the world his native language is only spoken inside his native land so because of the renown uh, because to survive in the publishing industry they actually needs to require the usage of english and this talks about how it is very difficult for a colonized uh, group of writers colonized right colonizer colonized uh, group of individuals to reject the colonialist ideologies their language their culture okay. so uh, many many writers also do not know how to write in their native languages because as i have already talked about the influence of the colonizers uh they are supposed to study in some english medium school so they have not learned uh their mother tongue properly bangla ta thik ache na there is a famous poem by bawani gosal mojumdar uh so people are actually following their uh english sources english knowledge first language is english not the bengali for our case so something like that so it is very difficult from for certain indigenous writers like chino ajibe who has mentioned this concept that for me there is no other choice i have been given the language and i intend to use it he has mentioned in in one of his uh, quote so the thing is he had no other option but to write in english so that is also talks about the effect of cultural colonialism now there are certain drawbacks of reclaiming the pre colonial past it's very difficult to discover the past because proper history is unavailable because of the colonial post cultural contact or through the military invention we can see culture changes for example after the norman conquest the entire culture of the anglo saxon changed right so similarly when uh, india has been invaded by many british or foreign rulers like we have sultani dynasties they came from outside then we have moguls then we have british people so all it's very difficult to find out what exactly were that kind of pre colonial past because it changes the culture changes because of the cross cultural contact between the outsiders and the natives there are certain cross cultural contacts so it is very difficult to reclaim that old past okay and this kind of cultural assimilation is very much mutual because pre colonial cultures for example the landing of cricket cricket is and very it is a very important uh, 
aspect in terms of colonialism. Cricket is something which has been played in England, which was oriented in England. And if you follow, for example, today's world, most of the countries which play cricket, they they are mostly Commonwealth countries. They were ruled by England. So cricket, cricket is one of the important colonial tools which can be seen here. Okay. Now, uh, before I talk something about hybridity, I want you to look at this photograph. It's a photo of a Bengali Babu. And if you follow the photograph, you can see he's wearing a dhuti and one jacket, one European jacket rather. And on his shoulder, he is actually placing some kind, some Uttariya or some chadar. But the thing here is that from the photo itself, we can uh, remind, we can, we can see that it's a it's an hybrid entity. You remember uh, Sukumar's famous poem, Kichuri. So this there is a constant uh, mingling of the two cultures and that gives rise to this kind of hybrid culture. So from the dress, you can understand this particular person is a product of the hybrid culture, both the European culture and the native culture, just like Swajaru and Haas, Haas Jaru, so the hybrid product. So hybridish, hybridization is not like the assimilation of both the culture, but rather it creates some kind of product or positive force which can be available uh, from hybridity and as I already mentioned this kind of hybrid culture was being produced because it was uh, the colonizer and colon, uh, colonized actually followed the cultures the dress the language of the colonizers and hence as the byproduct of the mimicry this hybrid cultures have evolved. Now, this hybridity actually generates certain concepts like nativism. So, nativism is something which is the emphasis on the indigenous culture or this is the way of understanding to eliminate all the European influences. So that is what we call as nativism. So through nativism, the people who are not hybrid, they actually want their, uh, their colonial culture, pre-colonial culture to regain their old uh, spot. So they actually endorse all the culture changing over time naturally. Say actually, they accept the natural change of the culture or the cross-cultural changes, but not the changes which has been dominated by the Western forces for their own way. So that is all nativism. Now, since we are studying post-colonial theory, uh, if we think about it deeply, we can see there are certain similarities with other theories. Most importantly, we have feminist theories. Uh, I have given one kind of comparative chart, like both for women and for the colonized people, they face similar kind of problem. The first one is the independent personal or the group identity, just like women uh, face in the hands of the patriarchal societies. Then it's very difficult for them to gain access to the political power and Patriarchy, just like colonizers, always try to prevent the free flow of thinking, speaking, and creating their own ideology for both the feminine, for the women, and also the colonized people. So, from this study, you can understand that for postcolonial women, we have double oppression. So this is what we can connect feminism 
and to some extent post colonialism here. So here is a quote by Anne McIntock who actually talks about uh, in a world where women had do two thirds of the world's work on 10 percent of the world's income and own less than one percent of the world's property. The promise of post colonialism has been history of hopes postponed. So it's a serious complaint on part of the feminist critics. Now, another very important term which comes out, which is neocolonialism. Neocolonialism is, you can say, post postcolonialism. It's an aftermath of the colonial system. It's something which is instead of direct subjugation, the British used to subjugate the Indians directly. Now, it's an indirect mode of subjugation. It can be political or economic or cultural. Okay, like today, uh, from this cartoon, let's move, look at this uh, cartoon. Uh, the first part we have Africa Ben, where we can see the West is actually holding the chain of the slavery to the African person. And the Africa now is the West, mostly USA. They are actually uh, the Western African countries, the Indian country, the uh, Asian countries, all are under huge debt. And now this colonialism is a new form of colonialism. That's why we call it neocolonialism. For example, Europeans come to India to take the cheap labor because uh, per capita income of the country is very low and the labors are very cheap. So it is for their own benefit. They use uh, several important states. And while doing this kind of states, they actually destroy all the struggling business, all the difficult things, all because suppose someone is selling certain product at a very cheap rate. So you are not going to buy it from your native people in a high price, right? You go back to the colonizers, the new colonizers who are giving it in a very cheap way. So it is actually destroying the struggling business, destroys the culture and also our ecology. So neocolonialism is, uh, it comes into effect with various uh, important, uh, various important uh, puppet regimes, we say, that is the country has been ruled by the local governments. But that local government is like a puppet in the hand of the West. And the Western countries, the influential countries, they had their own role to play. They actually, uh, they actually uh, take care of those puppets for, uh, for their help. And they do the ISO with like military interventions or like uh, some kind of military aid or medical aid benefits. Okay. So that's that's a that's the way of exercising neocolonialism. So unlike uh, the form is to some extent different, but the prospect is same. Just like the old time European colonialism and new through new colonialism, we can see this kind of financial and other forms of subjugation, and they create their own rules. Now. Neocolonialism gives rise to cultural imperialism, which is another important term in the context of colonial uh, colonial studies. So it's a new form of neocolonialism where uh, it's a direct result of economic domination. In this particular picture, I have given uh, several examples like Starbucks, Disney, or Mickey Mouse, McDonald's, KFC, Apple, Nike, all are foreign products, all our American products or European products. And what we exactly do to favor this and we actually forget our struggling business. How many of you have actually bought a smartphone from Indian origin or a laptop from uh, make in India, made in India. So it's a part of the cultural imperialism. We, because of the American cultural imperialism is one of the most pervasive forms of this phenomenon and through this kind of cultural imperialism 
this west especially america they have successfully put their weight behind their products and the weight is so high that we often go and purchase their product in higher price but we prefer not to buy popcorn from the outside of the mall but we prefer it to buy it from inside right paying much more money so it's something like that buying something inside and buying something outside of a shopping mall so that's a form of cultural imperialism now this entire study of post colonial criticism is a kind of form of cultural imperialism because most of the post colonial critics they are uh, they are born in the formerly colonized nations and most of them are educated in european universities and perhaps most of them live in abroad so they have lived their life as an intellectual elite of an academic ruling class and they had very little in common with the majority of the poor people the indigenous people the native people so from this idea we can we can we can see post colonial criticism as also a form of cultural imperialism okay so let us move uh, let us see the all the talks point which i have already mentioned that first thing which i have mentioned is that the encounter between the colonizer and the disruption of the indigenous culture and in post colonial literature we have one this aspect which is available in many novels is the journey of an european outsider through an unfamiliar wilderness with a native guide we have conrad's uh, heart of darkness which is a uh, beautiful example of this particular scenario then othering the concept of othering uh us me uh, us and them i have already mentioned and uh, the colonial cultures are considered as savage culture when compared to that european culture is put in a very high order then we have mimicry i talked about mimicry how the colonized uh, accept the cultures by following the dress behavior speech and lifestyle everything okay then uh, i have talked about exile exile and homelessness where despite staying in your own land people actually kill on home because of their cross cultural contacts they are neither ghar ka nor bahar ka right so now uh, i have talked about on homelessness and also double consciousness it's a feeling it's a very difficult feeling to stay between social and psychological demands of two antagonistic culture uh, then i have talked about hybridity how actually uh, because of the mimicry or cross cultural context it actually gives right to hybridity and also post colonial literature talks about the need for continuity with the pre colonial past and self definition of the political future how we are seeing ourselves in the next period of time without colonial interference that is very important aspect in post colonial studies now in the last part of my lecture i will be talking about uh, how post colonial criticism is been used in literature here i will be talking about several books i have already mentioned heart of darkness which is a very anti anti colonialist novel because it talks about the ivory trade by the europeans in congo uh, by the french people mostly and uh, conrad has talked about that uh, yes european are europeans are actually looting from african nations they are doing their ivory trades and all but what he has not mentioned he creates a very negative image of africa which has been graphically uh, represented by chino achebe in his uh, famous essay an image of africa racism in conrad's heart of darkness if we read the essay here chinua chime has actually talked about how the europeans despite i mean uh, he has actually targeted conrad how he is very much eurocentric he is very much unconsciously eurocentric 
he is actually con uh, he actually condemns european for being savage conrad has actually said that all the europeans who are uh, who are actually making money in africa they are actually destroying the natural resources of the africans and though they are very much cultured from outside they are savage inside just like the african counterparts so what does that mean he tries to mean that as rcb pointed out that rcb pointed out that conrad unconsciously has portrayed africans as prehistoric marks of uh, mass of pengit howling incomprehensible barbarians now if you follow the adjectives we are talking about some human beings we are not talking about some animals we are not talking about some uh, some very deformed animals who live in jungle but while talking about europeans he actually compared them when he was actually compared them with this uh, african tribal culture it was a presentation of unconscious eurocentrism and which has been exposed by chino achibe in this particular essay so here achibe actually uncovers the novels colonial subtext of which the text does not seem to be aware of now one very important aspect which is connected to postcolonialism is trauma homike baba has pointed out that traumas can actually connect cultures like slavery revolution civil war political mass murder all these things actually can connect two colonial uh, two ex colonized uh, countries okay and it talks about uh, the postcolonial literature also talks about the personal experience of people's trauma whose history has not has been ignored for example i have given uh, two uh, important writers nadim godimer and a famous american writer tony morrison they are from africa but in their in their works the sun story or tony morrison the beloved we can see that the trauma is very much personal it has nothing to do with the country and the trauma has certain effect of the colonialism which has been elaborated in this particular two books okay so what he is trying to say here the respective nationality south african nadim gadima was south african and tony morrison was american but they are from the first world countries but their respective nationality do not prevent their subjugation so in their case the trauma is very much personal and colonialism had its effect on this kind of personalized traumas now one very important aspect in postcolonial criticism is canonical counter discourse it's a counter discourse so there are several books written by the europeans uh, in several points of time which knowingly or unknowingly talks about the eurocentrism or the othering or the colonial subjugation there are many times where the writers actually do not uh, realize that they are actually uh, subverting some other culture so what uh, counter discourse colon canonical counter discourse to there are many native writers who actually point out how on in those so called important books which we often read in our syllabus also from uh, outside the syllabus we can see that how a postcon writer takes up a character of characters and all the basic of assumption of the basic british canonical text unveils all the colonialist assumption so let me give one example it will be very much clear to you the first book which i am going to talk about is jane eyre written by charlotte bronte very famous novel written in 1847 here along with the other thing we have a mention of one lady her name is bartha masham 
who is the uh, insane, drunken, violent woman who actually lives in the attic and who is also the wife of Rochester. So, Jane Eyre was actually seeing this lady, Bertha, and she is actually staying, she actually stays at the attic and her character has been presented as insane, drunken, violent. So, the other thing. Okay. So, if you see the description of Bartha stays in the novel, it's very black and it has scarlet visage and the room he inhibits is a wild beast den, something like that. So, the presentation of Bartha Mission, who is the European Rochester's wife, and who was actually from West Indies. So, canonical counter discourse of this particular novel is this particular book, White Sarayasu C, written by Jamaican born writer Jean Rice, who has written this post colonial response to Charlotte Bronte's Jenna. Here in this particular novel, she actually talks about the counter discourse. How, how the same woman, how the uh, woman who was actually living her peaceful life in Jamaica was driven to violent behavior because of the Rochester's imperialist oppression, because of her skin color, because of her race, because of her economic uh, difficulties. And in this particular book, the other way of representation, the canonical counter discourse has been presented by Jean Rice. Jean Rice here unmasked all the colonialist ideologies in Bronte's narrative and he has pointed out categorically, scene by scene, how Jean Rice participates in the act. The heroine also believes that Seriously, Bartha is very much drunk and violent, and that that's something which we can connect with non-whites or so-called savages. Okay, let us take some more example. We have Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe and James Quercy's Four. Okay, so in Robinson Crusoe, we can see uh, among other things, this is small part. Uh, Robinson Crusoe has actually uh, saved so-called saved one person who is very much uh, the land was a native and he has given a name called Friday. Okay. And that colonizer colonized representation, uh, though he uh, considered himself as companion, but in certain action from that particular book, we can find out that there are several examples where the relationship is not of companionship, but of colonizer colonization. So, in this case, the canonical counter discourse can be found in Poetry's Pope, where who uh, has actually reveals all the colonial ideologies by Daniel Nico in her in his novel, Provence and Pusum. Then we have one famous example uh, in the Tempest, uh, it's very popular text because it had been uh, canonical counter discourse uh, done in several times in the case of Tempest and there are many important writers, uh, very important critics like Helen Tiffin, they have actually talked about how uh, the political and psychological operation of the protagonist Posen Poles, she actually uh, made uh, that kind of colonialist subjugation of Caliban. Caliban the character of Caliban has been presented in a very dark manner. He has been uh, considered as a demon, is a very negative character. And uh, it was Prostel who was actually tame Caliban. So uh, it's an unknowingly uh, that the Eurocentric consideration has been taken place this uh, aspect as well. Okay, so let's take another example in uh, Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Here also uh, we can have very passing example because uh, most of the novel is not about that. This particular part where uh, the character Mr. Sir Thomas Burton 
he is actually a british gentleman he uh, is a very positive character perfect eccentric character he is well bred is rational is honorable and he had his agricultural enterprise in antigua antigua is in west indies barbados so mr bottom brings his money mr sir thomas actually brings his money from antigua and that is been talked in a very matter of fact way that is very common for a european to bring money from some other country by sudden enterprise and here from this novel we come to know that sir bottom is actually doing some kind of slave labor in antigua and all his money for his fine british estate depends on the success of his colonial enterprise and this is something which has been presented in a very matter of fact way so said in his book culture and imperialism points out that the novel draws a strong parallel between domestic international authority and the order in the operation of both depend on the guidance of the british patriot so sir thomas actually dominates he actually solves the problems in antigua antigua and while coming back from antigua he actually solves the problem so this particular character is a guiding force of the british patriarchy both in the term of colonialism and also in terms of feminism so as i already mentioned sir thomas trip to antigua is passingly mentioned but it's very much crucial to the action so what are the aspects what are the cause point of this kind of reading post colonial literature we have to see how the literary text explicitly or allegorically represent various aspect of colonial oppression so how exactly the colonial exercise takes place then it also talks about how the political and cultural operation overlap so apart from that i have also talked about hybridity how the hybrid culture makes the problematics of all the post colonial identities and psychology of anti colonial resistance is also something which we can uh, understand from post colonial literature okay so there are other important aspects such as how does the text reveal about the operation of cultural differences and the ways in which race religion class gender sexual orientation etc they actually form the individual identity and how it exactly colonial counter forces has its role to play in the creation of such identity and in post colonial literature we also see how the text respond to or comment on the characters on the topics as i have already mentioned all the passing references they also can be very important in our discussion because that particular part actually brings out the hidden or the subconscious or the unconscious phases of colonial subjugations okay so with this uh, i guess should stop my presentation uh thank you anindo uh thank you for your elaborative informative and insightful presentation of uh, post colonial theory and its proper implication and manifestation and in different uh, literary uh, actually uh, branches novels those by hajaba okay so uh, there are some uh, you know uh, queries from the side of the participants of course uh, should i present uh, these queries uh, yes, one please. by one yeah uh, yes one do it one by one, one in that I case think, I think. yeah yeah i think it will be better for so uh, first question how do the identities of one indigenous family inform our understanding of colonizers uh I'm sorry you can you please repeat that yeah yeah how do the identities of one indigenous family inform our understanding of colonial colonizers okay so when you are actually studying uh, the 
say ideology or the cultural construction of some indigenous family their livelihood how they are actually enjoying uh, their actual life that can be understood when they come to the colonial or uh, the cross cultural contact for example in, in this case colonialism when we compare all the indigenous lifestyle or their understanding with the colonial subjects and how actually it affects their livelihood from that context we can uh, safely say how the colonialism actually affects their altogether development and also their uh, cultural identity can say so yes uh, colonial ideology had a very distinct role to play in the understanding of aboriginal cultural identity okay uh, then uh, next query is uh, what is cultural hybridity in globalization Cultural hybridity. Cultural hybridity, uh, as we are in a uh, hybrid world, as I have already mentioned, multicultural world, uh, we live in a hybrid world and it had a very distinct role to play because, as I have already mentioned, in case of India, take the example of India. India has been uh, colonized not only by the British people, there are other uh, foreign uh, powers like Sultani dynasty I mentioned or say uh, the um, Mughals. So altogether they have changed the entire culture, culture of the country. The hybrid culture had some distinct important feature which is neither available in the pre-colonial past not available in our, uh, uh, say, the cultural forces of the colonizing power. So, hybrid identity had a very distinct role to play. And what is the uh, next part of the question? Uh, I mean, uh, the what is the end of the question you mentioned? What is uh, cultural hybridity in globalization? Globalization, yes. So, yes, globalization that is also a part of like it's a reflection of the cultural hybridity where we are actually undergoing our uh, days so it's directly uh, related so should we proceed to the next question next yeah uh, according to eurocentric view europeans call natives inferior in what sense in every sense in every sense from the same uh, like uh, their culture, their dress, everything. When you are calling someone a savage, that means you are putting yourself at the higher position. So it is the impurity at every level. That is the most devastating side of cultural domination. You make the other so other that you cannot actually place themselves with your own strategy. So yes, very much. And then next one is, uh, how does post-colonial theory explain identity formation? Uh, that I have already mentioned uh, in various level. Uh, I've talked about mimicry and I've talked about hybridity. So if you can recollect, uh, it had a great role to play in uh, identity formation as well. Uh, so there are uh, several levels which I have already mentioned. Uh, I will say please go back to my lecture once again. And I have already explained it in a detailed manner there. Okay, this is the last one, Aninda. Uh, is Orientalism mainly negative and deceptive or sometimes it is a mirror image of the native country and native people? The context is from which angle you are actually seeing the things. Your perspective is something which is very important. I talked about Orientalism and how it is being seen by the Europeans. It is not something which the native people actually see themselves. No one uh, will want to see themselves as 
some kind of deceitful or snake charmer or something like that which is very a kind of negative self image but from the innocentic perspective it is been told that the oriental people are very much all the negative things which imaginable so that's already i have mentioned that's another form of othering okay so it is the perspective which determines from where we are actually going to talk but from where we are actually going to see orientals okay aninda thank you once again aninda uh thank you for your uh, actually valuable presentation and as well as well as for your valuable presence okay so now i would request uh, mr abhishek chakraborty uh, to uh, take over the last session okay thank you sir uh, so we have now reached the near end of our webinar so it has been wonderful and informative few hours for all of us i thank dr hosein and dr pole for their enchanting and captivating lectures and for giving us their precious time i thank dr pradeep ghosh director medapur city college for his continuous encouragement and dr sudipta chakraborty principal medapur city college for his valuable back I would like to thank Mr. Abhishek Das, Office in Charge, for his suggestions, and Mr. Shuman Malik, Technical in Charge, for his tremendous tenacity to support the whole webinar process. I sincerely show my gratitude towards Dr. Rupita Raj, Mr. Rajkumar Bera, Mr. Prashant Pradhan, and especially Mr. Jagannath Shamanto for their efforts in making the webinar a success. Finally, I would like to thank all the participants for their eager participation. We all hope that in future we will meet again to attend such invigorating sessions organized by our college and department. And finally, I would like to request Mr. Prashant Pradhan, Assistant Professor of English, Department of Humanities, to end the webinar with his enlightening quote. Prashant, to you. okay uh, so thank you everyone for making our webinar a grand success okay, so we all know that uh, in this pandemic it is very difficult to chase after our dream but we just can't sit back thinking about when the time will be perfect so we have to pursue our dreams in this regard i'm just quoting some lines to conclude our webinar with the touch of positivity our dreams are never ending and they are not a few so stop wasting time anymore there is so much to do don't sit behind with folded hands anymore brand new opportunities are knocking at your door get up walk outside and start moving towards your goals don't be scared even if your uh, pocket is full uh, filled with holes even if your dreams are never ending and ideas are few you have you do have the capability to make them come true Okay so thank you all for making our webinar a grand success